Homes, businesses, cottages underwater as rain and the spring thaw continue to result in rising water levels from Bracebridge to Ottawa and points beyond that as well. In recent years, that list also included places such as Brantford, Toronto and Windsor. What's going on and do we have the right plans in place to deal with the flooding on the scale we've seen recently? Let's find out with Drew Dilkins. He's the mayor of Windsor, Ontario. Barbara Robinson, president, Norton Engineering. Glenn McGilvery, Managing Director for the Institute for Catastrophic Loss Reduction. Bonnie Fox, Manager of Policy and Planning with Conservation Ontario. And Andrea Manano, PhD candidate at the University of Waterloo and Manager of the Flood Policy Research Group. I welcome all of you to TVO tonight. Just before we get started with this gang, however, we are joined on the line from Ottawa by a fellow named Matt McKechnie. His home is currently partially submerged in waters overflowing the banks of the Ottawa River. And, uh, you know, what do I say? I wish we were speaking on happier circumstances, Matt, but we're grateful you could spare some time for us to come to Ottawa and tell us what's happening to your situation. Just before we start chatting, let's just show some video here uh, for people catching up on this story so they can see what's going on in parts of the province. So, Sheldon, roll the video if you would. That's the Chaudière Bridge that runs atop the Ottawa River. It connects Ottawa and Gatineau, and officials have closed it to pedestrians and traffic. This is also in Ottawa. Britannia Park, where there's been quite extensive flooding, Ottawa's declared a state of emergency. Let's keep going. Now, central Ontario, we're looking at an aerial view of Bracebridge. A hundred soldiers have been deployed to help with sandbagging and other relief efforts there in Bracebridge, Ontario. And finally, this is the scene in Muskoka Lakes where one of the streets, River Street, was certainly living up to its name. The area is facing more rainfall warnings and, like Ottawa, has declared a state of emergency. All right, that's the scene there. Matt, why don't you uh, give us the 411 on what's happened in your situation? Uh, well, yeah, I live in Gatineau and our house was completely flooded. Uh, it started just before Easter weekend and we were given an evacuation notice, I think, on um, Easter Friday, Good Friday. And so we took our two-year-old daughter, went back to my parents' house in Nepean, and uh, we've basically been there since because the water's risen so high that it's impossible <clears throat> to even get to anywhere close to our house. The last time they checked, it was four, four and a half feet high from the street. Um, now they're saying it could get as high as the countertops in our kitchen, and uh, the water may stay for... A couple weeks after that. I was going to say, we just saw a picture of it, and, and boy, Matt, I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but uh, are you ever going to get back in that house? It looks, that water looks awfully high. It does look high. I don't think we are. I don't think we are. Uh, the owner of the house, we were sort of renting to own it, and uh, the owner said that he, after redoing it and gutting it completely and renovating it after the 2017 flood, uh, he doesn't want to keep it. So um, he'll probably, it'll probably be destroyed, which is sad because it was a, a beautiful house. It was nature all around and um, the river's right there, woods, everything. It was a, it was a great spot. Hmm. How much notice were you given that you had to get out? Uh, about 24 hours, like we knew that something was happening and then they, they started handing out notices. On Thursday before Easter, we sort of got the inkling that uh, lots of stuff was going on, so there were people walking on the street, uh, putting up stakes <clears throat> on different properties so that the, I guess they could ch test the water levels. And um, at that point, we were just sort of waiting, and we thought at that point, we'd heard from different people and different um, city officials that uh, it, it might just be precautionary because of what happened in 2017, so not to get too worried. But then it, you know, uh, the next day it was very clear that something bad was going to happen, so we didn't want to wait around. We have a two and a half year old daughter, so we didn't want to wake up in the middle of the night with, you know, a foot of water in our house or something and have to get out then. So we got out before and uh, yeah, it looks like a pretty, we haven't been back since. You can't get uh, close to the property. It looks right. pretty bad from the photos. How much of your stuff were you able to save? That's the thing, uh, Steve. We're not really sure because we can't get back to the property. We moved a bunch of stuff upstairs that were valuables and uh, some keepsakes and things that meant a lot to us. The water, I don't think, is going to reach the second level. If it does, that means that all of Ottawa would be flooded. So I don't think it's going to get that high. But um, we moved a lot 
upstairs, but some stuff we put, you know, we kept in bins on top of the counters downstairs because we, we were on a time clock and so we kind of had to go. And um, so some things downstairs, a few little things in the, in the garage. The house doesn't have a basement, so it's on a concrete slab, but we don't really know until we get back to take a look and sort of see and survey the damage. We, we won't really know what we've lost. Now, the picture we saw of your home was just of your home. We couldn't tell if you had any neighbors who were in a similar set of circumstances. Do you know if, if that is mm -hmm. the case? Yes, uh, there, are, there are other homes. Our, ours is one of the lower ones on the street. What happened after 2017 is a lot of homes in the area um, were given money from the government to renovate, and what a lot of them did was jack up their foundations uh, by a few feet. So some of the homes in that area are higher, but the water is still, I mean, as you can tell from that photo, you can't see, the, you should be able to see a lawn in that photo, uh, road, our driveway, which is a high driveway. It actually goes up, it has a bit of a, a slope to it. So you can't see any of that. And so that, I know the whole region is, is struggling and all of, uh, especially our street in Gatineau is uh, having tough times. Now, just help me understand this. Be because you were renting and technically not yet the owner of the place, w did mm -hmm. you have insurance or did the owner have insurance and how's all that being handled? No, so what happened was we, we had tenant insurance, which we thought um, would cover us because we were, we were renting. And so that usually would cover your contents dur during specific things. But in Quebec, there's no way that you can be a tenant or a renter of a, um, a home and be covered by flood insurance. So there was an exclusion in the policy about anything to do with floods. Of course, it was super small and hidden away in a small part. So we didn't know about that until I had to call the insurance company to say, hey, what's gonna happen with our stuff? Like we're being flooded. And they were basically um, said something to the tune of, oh yeah, it's a flood. We're not, we, we can't cover anything to do with floods, so. So whatever you've lost, sort of you're on the hook for. Exactly, hmm. that's right. I hear that you're doing a GoFundMe page in order to kind of uh, help defray your losses. How's that going? That's right. It, it is going amazingly well so far. Like we're, we're so blown away by all the generosity of people and uh, people really wanted to step forward and help. And specifically, I think people who've had floods happen before who have dealt with insurance it's a it's a common thing, I guess, uh, that insurance for tenants, really only homeowners are covered uh, during a flood, and I think you have to get a separate flood waiver or something like that. It's not, it's not easy, and it's kind of complex. So, um, yeah, we're, we're we're we've been very happy with the progress of the the GoFundMe, and people are really giving and quickly too, and it, from places you'd never expect, people you'd never expect, some, people you don't even know. Lots of people have shared it, so we've been really, um, you know, floored by that. It's been amazing. Good to hear. Let me ask you one last question, mm -hmm. Matt, because we're, we're grateful for the time sure. that you've been able to spare for us. Uh, are you hanging Problem. in there? Yeah, um, we are, for sure. It's been kind of nice because my daughter has spent a lot of time with her grandparents. My parents, and um, they live in Nepean, so we've kind of taken over their house and it's sort of become like a, a bit of a hangout time for her. And yeah, it's, it, that part's been really nice. And, and we just kind of are, um, my partner Jillian and I are just kind of like getting our, get our strength from seeing Sloan and all that stuff. And, and uh, Sloan is our daughter and mm -hmm. just seeing how she is just happy. And, and, and a lot of people have just come forward really just wanting to help. So that's pretty awesome. And uh, in any situation, you. You know, you can always look at all of the negatives, which there are a ton of in this situation, but we are really trying to stay positive and being grateful for what we do have. Good for you. We wish you the best, okay? And thanks so much for joining us tonight on TVO, Matt. Thanks, Steve. Take care. Okay, all the best to you. Okay, Matt McKechnie, Gatineau from Ottawa. Glenn, let me come to you first on this. How common are stories like the one we just heard? Uh, unfortunately, far too common. I mean, this time around, we're seeing people that have been flooded twice in two years, Ottawa, Gatineau, Montreal, places like that. In New Brunswick, we're seeing people that have been flooded twice in uh, one year. Uh, this is riverine flooding. Uh, in Windsor, not too long ago, two big events in less than just under uh, 12 months. Uh, 
you know, heavy rainfall in Toronto, heavy rainfall in Burlington, Brantford, you name it, the list is, is, is long and growing all the time. So, so these it's are very common. unusual, unusually repetitive weather circumstances. Should we put it that way? Well, I, you know, I, I'm really careful to say that. I mean, when we were looking at what's going on today, this is the spring freshet, and, and it's been going on since the beginning of time. And mm -hmm. so we really have to be careful about, you know, how we, we, we say, you know, well, this is really extraordinary because when we do that, then we treat it with, a, with you know, we have to treat it in a, in, in a different way and just say, you know, this is common, uh, getting more common it seems, and we have to do something about it. But to say it's extraordinary, we really have to, I think, be careful. Okay, fair point. Yeah. If you look at the monitors here in the studio, Sheldon, can I ask you to bring that map up next? Here is flooding in Ontario as of just the other day. And the I'll describe this a bit for people listening on podcast. Uh, the red splotches on the map, which go all the way up to Hudson Bay, James Bay, coming all the way down past Timmins, Huntsville, Ottawa. That big red swath is flood warning. And of course, that would be Matt McKechnie's property in that area as well. We then see a big patch of, looks like rust or orange or yellow, whatever, whatever color that is. And that starts again, north of Timmins, um, closer to the center of the province, and then moving down through central Ontario and right through southwestern Ontario, through Toronto, Brantford, London, Chatham, all the way into Windsor, all those areas north of Lake Erie. And in northwestern Ontario, they seem to be fine for the moment. Uh, but lots of Ontario, as you can see from that map, if you can see it, under flood warning or flood watch. Barbara, how big a problem is flooding in the province of Ontario? Well, um, we're, seeing, we're seeing more flooding, to be sure. Uh, the flooding is becoming more expensive for, for reasons that don't necessarily have to do with the frequency. Um, the kind of flooding I do, I'm an expert in urban flooding, which is different than riverine flooding. Uh, urban flooding is, happens within the urban uh, boundary rather than as a result of a water level, lake or river uh, high. So um, the risk of flood across Ontario, I would say that everybody in Ontario is currently at risk of flooding. I mean... You just said everybody. Yeah. That would be my, uh, yes, I would, I would make that statement, <laughs> yes. Everybody in Ontario is at risk of some kind of flood. Not sure. necessarily by rising rivers, but something. Sure. Well, the Burlington floods, I mean, Burlington wasn't accustomed to be flooding before, but if a big storm parks over your, over your town and dumps a bunch of rain on you, the sewer systems are only designed for a certain return period or whatever, and if they start backing up, everybody can get flooded. So, Bonnie, what's your view on that? Yeah, um, well, when I was looking at the map, I was thinking if you were to process that map for today, uh, Lake Ontario uh, water level warnings have come out and Lake Erie water level warnings as well for flooding. Uh, so I think that the red might be a little bit different across the, the, the northern uh, shores of, uh, of, of the Great Lakes. And um, uh, it, it is something that the conservation authorities, they do flood forecast and warning. So they work with the province um, on, on knowing what, uh, what the rain is, the snow for the Great Lakes, what the waves are that are coming, mm -hmm. uh, if, if there's high winds. There are um, high waves on Lake Ontario today as well. So that combined with all those other factors and the rainfall uh, affects how you forecast and, and warn mm -hmm. people about what to expect. Well, I think they, w they know what to expect in Windsor. Mm -hmm. uh, Your Worship, do you want to tell us what you went through a couple of years ago? Yeah, it wasn't pleasant. I certainly the the interview with Matt. I, I feel for Matt and his family and everyone who's in that particular area. But, mm -hmm. uh, but Steve, it really goes back to uh, 2010. Two big events in the city of Windsor: around 90 millimeters of rainfall, a, a very intense uh, amount of rainfall, caused uh, probably a thousand homes to flood. And the city reacted in some very uh, direct ways after that. But then, as we're moving forward, 2016, uh, we see uh, 190 millimeters of rainfall. Again, uh, over a very short period or a very prolonged period of time, uh, but uh, the, the impact was about 2,800 uh, basements flooding uh, in the city of Windsor, followed by, as Glenn mentioned, less than a year later, the largest uh, flood in the city's history, uh, 220 millimeters of rain, uh, affected over uh, 6,600 homeowners and uh, caused about $175 million in loss in the city of Windsor. So uh, quite dramatic to see that amount of garbage uh, out on the street, people just having to empty their basements, uh, really disrupting uh, lives. And, and I'll tell you, we were, we were trying to bring garbage trucks all the way from North Bay uh, to help move the garbage, trying to bring them in from the United States. Uh, but there was a hurricane down in Texas. So I mean, we were, we were trying to get resources to deal with what we saw on the street. 
uh, but quite, 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 quite catastrophic in the city of Windsor and certainly we're as flat as a pancake and surrounded by water. Mm. So we get scared about prolonged rainstorms, but also high lake levels as well. How is it right now? Uh, right now we're, we have a flood watch uh, in effect and, uh, and so people are scared. These types of events play on people's psyche. Uh, and that's that's one thing we have to remember. This is not just, okay, it's one sort of extreme weather event and it goes away and everyone moves on with their life. It actually does have a lasting impact on people. And, and certainly as a as a mayor, as a local politician, you want to help. You're, you're there to help the residents. And this is just one type of event where you have very little within your control that you can do. Uh, but we've done everything we can do. Uh, we thank the uh, the federal government. Recently, recently came down last week. Uh, we put together a $90 million dollar uh, part of our sewer master plan, a $90 million first phase. Uh, they came down and funded a third of that. So we're committed to trying to make the improvements uh, that we can make, but we're also cognizant of the fact that our sewer system in totality is about 1,700 kilometers long. And so for perspective, that would be like driving from Windsor to Orlando. Hmm. And so there's a lot of work to do. It took 100 years to build the system. It's gonna take many, many decades uh, to make the improvements. We should just say on the issue of sewers, you and I are going to have a, another Good conversation thing, yeah. after this one is over about the sewers because there's a lot more to talk about there as well. Yeah. Andrea, how easy is it for someone to find out if they live in an area that's prone to flooding before they move into an area that's prone to flooding? Yeah, you know, that's a, a great question. And um, it's, it's, you know, what, what you hear a lot of the times is what Matt is experiencing of figuring this out after there is water in his basement or in his house and he is getting flooded and then figuring out that his insurance uh, policy does not cover uh, flooding and flood repairs. You know, it's a lot easier when you have this like additional funding that will help you kind of recover out of that situation. But we did a study uh, across Canada. We looked at 280 municipalities. Who's we? Uh, we, as in my research group uh, at the University of Waterloo, including uh, two professors there. And uh, we were interested in like figuring out, okay, if I am a concerned citizen and I look at the news and I'm being told by my governments that I should be flood aware, that I have to be ready, what information would I find? And it's not necessarily easy. It's not easy, and it's not easy in Ontario uh, um, either, unfortunately. Um, we looked at, for example, the city of Hamilton. Uh, you have a variety of conservation authorities that publish their flood maps online. So depending on where you are in the city of Hamilton, you would have to figure out which conservation authority you fall under and then kind of look in those channels. Are the maps out of date? Um, a lot of the times, yes. We found significant issues uh, in British Columbia, for example. Uh, you can kind of find these. It's kind of funny, actually. Um, in the provincial website, it's kind of divided by region, and then it's divided by rivers. So figure out where your community is in relation to those rivers, and figure out which flood map. And then it's like five or six clicks later. I actually, when I first came across one of the maps there, I didn't know that I had to click on it to then get to the actual map. And then at the end of the day, the information just tells you a piece of the story. And hmm. it just focuses on, focuses on flood plains as what we regulate, for example, here in Ontario, flood plains, which is a river flood. Bonnie, I should let you comment yeah, on that. Yeah, if, if I could mention, there mm -hmm. is a um, um, Ontario um, flood, flood forecast warning website and has a map of Ontario. You, you can click on it. Um, and uh, and then that will get you to the conservation authority and what the warnings are for that area. But I, I had to have someone kind of take me through to, to show me what the even with that website what the dynamics were and what you could find out from it. It's not that um, user friendly. Maybe I'm not a good person to ask that question of, right? <laughs> <laughs> My daughter always tells me, it, it's intuitive. And, uh, and I always say, not to me. Um, so, so maybe I'm not a good person to ask that question, but uh, certainly the conservation authorities, if someone's looking to buy a home, the conservation authorities, we do get real estate inquiries. Um, and so uh, they are a source of information for if you're in a floodplain or not. Mm -hmm. Uh, Andrea's correct. Um, some have the maps up on websites. Uh, some still have paper maps. Hmm. Um, and, you know, we really need to see that mapping, like, to, to be able to provide it to the public easily. Yeah. We, we need the mapping. Can I to follow be up with Andrea on that? Digitized. Are, are, yeah. are there municipalities in the province of Ontario that do a good job of having maps up to date and easily accessible 
to people? Mm, I don't, I, you know what, I haven't been necessarily impressed. I will say that the uh, Grand River Conservation That's Authority nice. does a really great job. At, they collaborate actually with the police. Um, to kind of get these uh, brochures that have the maps and different zones that are at risk and kind of advice for homeowners. But again, because conservation authorities um, and again, the kind of responsibility around flooding in Ontario is divided by municipalities focus on stormwater management, conservation authorities focus on rivers. It's, um, you can't, and at least I have not been able to find a map that shows me both. Hmm. Um, and I could comment, um, uh, I live in the Grand River uh, Conservation Authority area and friends of mine were buying a home and they asked me, of course, because I'm the sewer expert. You, you, you should tell people where that is because not everybody oh, knows pardon me. So Kitchener Waterloo, yeah. Okay. So, uh, and there is flooding along the Nith River every year or, or frequently in Kitchener Waterloo. So these friends were buying a new home and they said, um, how do we find out if we're in the floodplain? And I said, well, just look up the floodplain mapping. These are two university educated people uh, and I was kind of busy at the time so three days went by and they called me again and said we can't make heads or tails of this can you help us so then I went and found the information for them but it's not intuitive. Hmm. I, I don't think it's reasonable to expect the average person to be able to first access the map and then understand it. Mm -hmm. huh. So if you look at North Carolina they have an online portal you put in your zip code you get your flood risk on your at the property level and there are other places that do this they're Eastern uh, European countries and things of that nature and that's what we really need a simple tool to put in your postal code get the risk for that property. Whose responsibility should it be to have that done? Well, it could be any number of, of you know, groups' responsibilities. It could be done on the private side, it could be done on the insurance industry side or federal government side. Um, but we certainly need something, and maybe we should all work together and, and come up with a good tool. How are Windsor's this, maps looking? Well, we, we actually have started the process of completing a, a comprehens comprehensive flood uh, uh, a plain map. Uh, so the, I agree with Glenn, uh, but that, that sort of interface needs to be backed up by the data on the back end. We're preparing that data, uh, and I agree. I, if there was some easy way for people to understand what the impact could be uh, based on where they are looking to live, yeah. uh, that, would be a, that would help people make an informed choice, and that would be good. Well, informed choice is a key thing here because I wonder, Andrea, how people are supposed to make intelligent planning decisions with information that is a decade out of date. How do you do that? Yeah, and so I think that's a, that's a fundamental challenge. Um, again, going back, uh, even um, maybe giving the example of Nova Scotia, um, I think that there's a lot of expertise in Nova Scotia. I've worked very closely with some of the professionals down there. Um, I've talked to them about floodplain maps and they also would like to see something um, as guidance from the provincial government to, to say, you know, at the municipal level, we are going to restrict development here and this is kind of provincially mandated. So they have this like backup, you know, and, and it's not just simply as a, leave it to small municipalities that sometimes have, you know, 700 people that live there. They're quite small to make these um, sometimes difficult choices uh, because you have um, sort of pushback from property developers and that type of thing. Glenn, do floodplain maps have an impact on the rate of insurance that people pay? Well, absolutely, they should anyway. Uh, uh, and I should say that flood insurance is new to this country. We've only had it for just over three years, so February 2015. Um, and uh, uh, a lot of the flood insurance products right now are working off of models and modeled maps and some old uh, information, unfortunately. So we do need some new maps. But certainly if you're in a very high risk area, that's an issue. You're probably not going to be able to get uh, flood insurance. At least only one company offers it for high risk individuals and nobody else does at this time. Uh, so there has to be a discussion about what to do with, with those in the high risk floodplain. But certainly uh, if you're in, uh, in a high risk or, or slightly high risk area, it's certainly gonna have an impact on your flood insurance rate. Are we still, Bonnie, building homes on floodplains in this province? I'd like to say no. Um, so the, the the way that Ontario regulates uh, the floodplains, um, the conservation authorities um, would look at, it's a permissive regulation. So we do have to look at whether or not development can occur according to the risk. And so um, that can be challenged by the fact that what is the status of the um, uh, of the floodplain maps and, and the hazard risk maps that, that we're using uh, in the areas where we don't have the comprehensive, um, the updated uh, versions, then um, you know we're asking the developers to, to do some modeling. We check the modeling. Um, and, uh, and so for, for the most part, 
I would say that development is happening outside of our floodplains in Ontario where there are conservation authorities. One of the responsibilities um, through the flood management program with the province is that the conservation authorities work with the municipalities on their official plans and where are the hazard areas, um, where are the higher risk areas, and, the, and then that becomes kind of a constraint map for mm -hmm. the developers to know. We, they don't, I don't think they want to build their houses in, in right. the floodplain either. All right, let this, should we talk about the elephant that's in the room here? And I know, right. Glenn, you were very careful uh, when I asked you about this right off the top, not to say this is all because of climate change. Okay, I get that. Mm -hmm. Having said that, Mayor Delkins, your briefings, your understanding of the science, what uh, officials at senior levels of government end up telling you about all of this, what have you concluded as to whether or not climate change is playing a role in any of what we're talking about tonight? Well, I, I, I can tell you there'll be a debate if I said something here. People are going to, I'll get 500 emails by the time I get back <laughs> home. But something has changed in my 47 years on the planet and my 47 years living in the city of Windsor. Something has changed from year one to year 47. And I've seen it play out, unfortunately, in my time as an elected official. And I would say, you know, at least regionally uh, in Essex County, we're working smarter, we're working more collaboratively, we're very conscious and more risk averse when it comes to making decisions for development. Uh, but, you know, I won't get into the debate on climate change, but something is happening and we're seeing, you know, changes that we have to deal with. And, I, you know, I, I, this, is, this is one of those maps, Steve, where I, I show this map. These are, Which, let these me are the 6,600. Show what camera you want this map to. <laughs> camera these, three, right there. Okay, hold it up to that camera. These, these uh, 6,600 folks would certainly tell you that something's changing. So uh, the, the, the patchy infected. blue areas are? That, it, that are the report, those are the reported homeowners who've had basement flooding in either 2016 or 2017. That, that looks like half the city almost. It's, it's, it's dramatic. Or certainly a it's third dramatic. of it anyway. If I could comment, the rain huh. actually followed, it, it you can flooded see the right underneath uh, the rain band. So that was rain related. That was sewer flooding rather than uh, urban flooding rather, rather than, than river River flooding. overflows, yeah. okay. And I'm not sure if you know, Steve, 350,000 people in Ontario right now today live in floodplains. 350,000, yes. And not all of them would be aware of that. And they're probably not going anywhere, right? That's home. That's where they, <laughs> that's yes. where they planted their flag. Yeah, I, yeah. Huh. Tell us whether uh, you think climate change affects infrastructure planning right now. Well, that's another interesting question. Um, certainly, I don't think we need to start oversizing pipes for infrastructure. I think we need to, as, as engineers, we design pipes based on uh, available data and good data. Um, the data we use for, for designing sewer infrastructure, well, I'm not really seeing a change in the uh, IDF curves, we call them, the, the curve we pull off the proposed rainfall from. So we, we're not actually seeing that in our data sets yet. That doesn't mean it's not happening. But I will say, um, I'm, I'm getting concerned with the media. I mean, everybody is on media to making broad statements about climate change and it's this and it's that. You know, let's let the climatologists um, tell us whether climate change is coming and what it looks like. I'm a civil engineer. I'm not going to comment on climate change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it appears there's more flooding. I would agree. There's a lot of other things going on in watersheds that might be contributing to that flooding. So you can't necessarily connect the dots between A, B, C, and D right it's now. It's probably happening, Steve, yeah. but listen, let's talk to climatologists and have them tell us. Gotcha. Glenn, let me get you in here because you said 350,000 people in the province of Ontario live no. on floodplains. Okay. Quebec, I gather, has implemented a, what do they call it, a, like a buyback program, something Bio of that program, age? Right. Bio program, right. Bio program, so that if you're in that kind of a situation, uh, you know, they'll help you out. Do we need something like that here? We certainly do. Uh, you know, we're seeing these repeated events, and uh, the tone this time around is kind of a enough's enough type of, type of idea. Now, I don't want to sound callous, um, you know, listening to Matt earlier, this is horrific for people and we really have to make uh, people whole again and get them back on their feet again. But this is not sustainable. This whole idea... What is not sustainable? This whole idea of uh, build, flood, clean up, flood again, clean up, flood again, hmm. clean up, pay them money, pay them disaster assistance, pay them insurance. We can't keep this up. Um, the feeling is that uh, flooding is going to get worse in the future for many reasons. Climate change is just one of them. Um, and uh, it's just folly. It makes no sense whatsoever, particularly for people in the high-risk flood area. Now, we're not saying buy everybody out, but there are people that are right in the floodway. That is basically right next to the rivers. They will flood again, and they will flood again. It might be next year. It might be two years. It might be five years. But we'll be back here talking about it again. 
and uh, it just doesn't make sense. We can't keep it up. Your Worship, what about this buyback program? Is that something that you think would fly in Windsor? Well, I, I don't think that, I, I think, I think what Glenn's referring to is, is buyback related to overland flooding. And when it comes to, to basement flooding, that's what I'm talking about in the city of Windsor. Uh, it wouldn't be uh, practical to, to consider that for a basement flood. But, but certainly I agree. And if you look at some uh, European jurisdictions, uh, they're very strategic in the way, in the way that they allow development uh, such that they would not be uh, paying insurance claims time and time again, uh, just as Glenna suggested. Let me get Andrea and Bonnie then on the mm -hmm. buyback program. What do you think of them? So I think that what Quebec is doing is probably what other provinces will eventually adopt as well um, because they basically are capping the amount of losses that a person can experience. So if you, I think it's something around $100,000. If you have more than $100,000 worth of damage, they will buy you out. And I think there's a limit to that of 200000 So 200000 for you to move out of where you are living. Um, in Ontario, uh, you know, the conservation authorities and in terms of like regulating the floodplain, that, that uh, legislation, I think it came in the 50s. So basically homes that were built before that, including parts of the downtown area where I live in, in the city of Waterloo, are on a floodplain. So these are very difficult conversations to have, um, but in some cases it does make sense because it's like repeat flooding and mm. the person goes through the same thing. Andrew, can I ask you this though? Yes. If, if you get 200K, Mm -hmm. And your house is worth 250. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. If your house is worth 750 and you're only offered 200, mm -hmm. that doesn't make as much sense, I guess, does it? No, it doesn't. And I think that those are some of the criticisms that I've seen uh, recently in the media from some experts talking about this that it's not necessarily a fair price. I can't really comment on that, but I can feel for those families because your house is your in your investment. It's your retirement. Mm -hmm. So. These are not easy circumstances, and I, again, it's why it's so important to regulate that floodplain, to make sure that we don't create more of these kinds of problems. Funny. So um, the conservation authorities, they have been involved with uh, um, buyback, um, you know, buying hazard lands. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of hazard land was bought uh, in previous decades. It's not something that um, typically, it has been explored in some situations. Um, where you know it's it's a municipal conservation authority conversation um, and just the high risk that they're at, um, but then it comes down to money and and fairness and um, and all of that. I, I would like to mention in terms of disaster relief payments, in um, uh, the Ottawa River and Lake Ontario, uh, high water levels a few years ago where where the flooding happened and there were damages and. And the, uh, the disaster program, it was to be eligible for the funding, they had to rebuild in the same, on the same foundation. Hmm. And, uh, Does that and make so, sense to you? No. And so the <laughs> conservation authorities uh, would, would like to see you know, conditions where, you know, at least floodproof. Uh, and Matt had mentioned that some of the neighbors had, had raised the house, the foundations up, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. At least do um, floodproofing. And if we can get the buildings back as far back from the risk, as possible in the building envelope, um, but I mean, general policy is that if if something if property is destroyed by a natural hazard, we shouldn't be repeating the same mistake over yes. and over again. Yeah, I, but, well, but it's it's people's homes. It's a very no, I get difficult. it. There's that emotional connection. Oh, I want to find out what uh, what the city of Windsor has done, Your Worship, given uh, all of the flooding problems you've had there over the last uh, well almost decade now. What changes have you made to deal with all of this? Well, after 2010, uh, we started a very comprehensive program with respect to smoke and dye testing, full camera inspections of our entire sewer system. Hang on, uh, hit the brakes for a second. <laughs> smoke and dye testing? So you, you, actually, what is that? you actually blow smoke into the sewer system and you look for uh, cross connections, con connections that aren't, that are supposed you, to be attached. You can see the aren't. smoke coming out of the, you plug this sewer system at either end of a manhole and you force smoke into it and it goes up the laterals and up through any openings in the sewer. So you'll see it come out of um, the stack in your house or, or out of your um, uh, 
downspouts at the top of your downspouts. The okay. smoke comes out, and so we can visually confirm that there's a hydraulic connection between roof roof water and and uh, the sanitary sewer. You still allowed to call it a manhole cover? Oh, everyone says maintenance holes, maintenance, maintenance holes. Hole. Okay. But I've been doing this for 30 years, and it's just manhole to me. Okay, yeah. so continue on if you would. So, so it's just like being in Rome. They put the smoke in, and they wait for it to rise up, and you know, see if there's a we'll see, if, we uh, have see a if there's a problem. So, uh, so there, there's that. Uh, we also implemented uh, almost immediately a basement flooding uh, subsidy protection program. And that program funds uh, up to $2,800 for specific elements, uh, the installation of a backflow uh, a valve, uh, a sump pump, and different kinds of uh, elements, up to $2,800. Uh, Did you get to much help. uptake on that? Oh, boy. Uh, mm -hmm. Over 12,000 uh, homeowners applied. We've already paid out 6,000 claims, over $13 million. And, and frankly, uh, at least in the city of Windsor, with respect to basement flooding, we could do all of the things that have been mentioned here in terms of oversizing, adding pump capacity, all of the things that you know, seem obvious to the average homeowner. Mm -hmm. Uh, but even if we do that, we know that homeowners still have to take the responsibility to make changes in their home. And so the city is, is a, I mean, I, I can't do any more than 100%. Uh, <laughs> we're being a very strong partner trying to encourage homeowners as we move through all of the elements of our sewer master plan, which are likely to cost the city of Windsor half a billion dollars uh, in today's dollars. As we move through those elements, we have, and it's going to take us Over decades. It's going to take us decades to do this. We have to, and we're encouraging them, take the first line of defense yourself. We're willing to fund up to $2,800. Give yourself a fighting chance. Because all of the folks that I showed you there have, 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 have also had issues with respect to their insurance. Right. And if, they're not, if they weren't cancelled after 2016 and it happened in 2017, you can bet that they were cancelled or their premiums went up. And they've had difficulty. And so okay. we, want, we want to help and the city's there to help them. Okay, that is our time. I want to thank everybody for coming into TVO tonight and helping us out with this. Drew Dilkins, the Mayor of Windsor, came a long way to be with us tonight. Thank you for doing so. Bonnie Fox from Conservation Ontario. Barbara Robinson, Norton Engineering. Glenn McGilvery, the Institute for Catastrophic Loss Reduction. That is a great name for an organization. And Andrea Manano, uh, whom we wish good luck finishing her PhD at the University of Waterloo. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.